what you think of this one. I've never preached a sermon with this topic before. Let's hope it shows up on the big screen. How to pray against God's will. That's probably not what you were expecting. Patricia looks shocked. She looks very worried. How to pray against God's will. Stone, that's it. What is going on in Watford? It's going all weird in Watford today. Even beat Arsenal yesterday. I know. Yeah, yeah. Strange things are happening around these parts. Anyway, how to pray against God's will. What are we dealing with here? Well, let's have a look at our passage and then let's talk about it together here. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 and we're looking at verses 39 to 46. <clears throat> it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. A fascinating insight into the prayer life of Jesus, his relationship with his Father, and really helpful for us, I think, in our prayer life and our relationship with God as Father, if we understand some things from this passage. What is Jesus wrestling with here? Surely he is wrestling with doing God's will. He's gone to Gethsemane, a place where he often prayed. Some of us have been there, Charlotte Bronwyn, you've been to Gethsemane. Anybody else? It's an amazing, yeah, you've been there, yeah. It's, uh, it's worth going to Israel. It's worth going to that special place. It's worth going there and praying. Imagine praying in the very place where Jesus prayed this prayer. It's still there on the Mount of Olives. He was there with his disciples. He felt the need to pray. He felt the need to pray for lots of reasons. Because the cross was looming. Darkness was coming. And the most significant test of his life on earth was about to unfold. So, he goes to the garden, and he prays this prayer where he asks, essentially, if possible, that God's will be changed. Doesn't Jesus already know God's will? He must. And yet he's, in a sense, asking, he's praying, in a sense, against God's will. He's praying for a different way out of the situation. But we'll talk about the quality of his prayer in a minute. Let's think about what he's facing. Uh, he says, I would like this cup taken away from me. Now, when you think of cups, there are some which are more pleasant than others. Uh, what kind of cup are we talking about here? I really like my coffee, and I especially think Cafe Nero has the best coffee. I'm putting that on video, clearly for the world to agree with me. Um, but some cups are not as pleasant. What's the most disgusting stuff you've ever had to drink? if you can share it publicly. Let me ask you, when have you had to drink something that you thought, why am I drinking this? This is horrible. What's the most disgusting stuff you've ever had to drink out of a cup or a beaker or a something? Yeah, okay? When we were four in Nigeria, my mom used to give us this drink that was always easy to get rid of when you have too much sugar or worms. And it was disgusting. It was green, bitter green leaf. Bitter green leaf. Green, we all had to drink it. You pinch your nose and drink. You pinch your nose. When you have to pinch your nose to drink something, that, that's a pretty bad sign. Yeah, Dan? I do cops your green ones, and somebody offered me their homemade red wine. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I have to apply for them. He's off the Christmas list. 
Yeah, Dan's on that. So, for those of you, never mind, I won't explain that. For those of you who don't understand that, Danny will explain later. Oh my goodness. Yeah, fair enough. All right. What else? Anything else? We've drunk, we thought, what, what on earth am I drinking? You need some medicine. Some kind of medicine. Yeah. Something like that. I'm taking something from Gatling, but I'm not sure I can share. Ah, well. It's one of those initiation type things when there is. Let's say um, a cup made up of fluid from different people. Okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that sounds worth the same thing. It spits. Okay. Spits. Oh, okay. <laughs> well. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. Maybe. Um. Maybe we won't even try. We won't try and top that. Well, we'll just we'll just leave it at that. We've all probably had to drink something pretty disgusting in our time, usually for med- medical reasons, as you say. But what is Jesus about to do? He's about to drink this symbolic cup of what? Well, I have a brief look at some of these scriptures here. I think I'm, I've got a handout for us with these on, so you don't need to write these down, okay? But just to try and read these. Psalm 11. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals, burning sulfur, a scorching wind will be their lot. The word lot is there, but it is, it, the word is in the Hebrew cup. So he's talking about God's wrath here. Isaiah 51. Awake, awake, rise up Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You who have drained to his dregs the goblet that makes people stagger. Ezekiel 23. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. Psalm 75, in the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine, mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Jeremiah 25, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take from my hand this cup filled the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. The cup that Jesus is talking about here is the cup of God's wrath, God's judgment on not only a few nations or a few bad people who did a few bad things. All the evil, all the sin, all the wrongdoing of all peoples of all time is in this cup. He has to drink this and experience its punishment on the cross. No wonder he's a little hesitant about taking this cup. And no wonder he prays, asking whether, God, is there another way? This is the cup he's talking about at the Lord's Supper. And when we drink the the wine, which we do, as Barry helped us with earlier, We are remembering that we're not drinking a cup of wrath. We're drinking a cup of forgiveness because Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath on the cross. What an intense thing. He he even prays so hard that he's in anguish and that what appears to be like drops of blood fall to the ground. There's a possibility that that's a medical condition that happens when you're very stressed. Or it could just be Luke's description of he sweat so much that these big blobs that looked a bit like blood were, were just coming onto the ground. I mean, we don't know exactly, but whatever it is, the word anguish is hardly enough. In the Greek, it's uh, agonia, from which we get the word agony. It's the only time that word is used in the New Testament. It's a very intense word describing the way that Jesus prayed. He was going through it here. And at his time of need, uh, what were his friends doing? Yeah, they were exhausted from sorrow. We don't know exactly what that means, I think, but nonetheless, they weren't able to share in this experience. So let's think about this for a minute, and then I've got a little thing for us all to do together. Are we allowed to pray against God's will? Let me ask you that, and let's just let's, let's talk about this for a minute, and then uh, we'll do something together. What do you think? Are there any circumstances in which you think it's okay to pray against God's will? Because Jesus seems to be doing it here. Please take this away. Is there another way? So what do you think? Dan? Amen. Hey, uh, <coughs> it's salvation of other people. Okay. Examples in the Old Testament where 
Moses and Abraham bargain with God. Then I can save a few. If we can save a few, Abraham with God, uh, Moses similarly. Okay, yeah. Good, thanks. Okay, any other examples or circumstances in which you think we might pray and say, God, please, can it, there must be another way. What, what would you say? Any, anything else you can think of? Uh, yeah, Kate. Um, Someone being ill. It could be God's will that they, pers- not that they heal perhaps, but that they learn lessons through that illness or something. There could be another purpose to it, but we could pray. Yeah. For that, we're going to be healed. Yeah, okay. Got one because we often pray for healing, mm-hmm. and he might not want it. So pray God. to pray for God's <coughs> will to be done, okay. which is not always what we want. But it would be human, <laughs> wouldn't it, to express our desire for someone to be healed, healed, even if it may not necessarily be God's will at that time. Yeah. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah, good. Anything else? It's a tough one, isn't it? Because it doesn't seem right. Leon. There's quite a few examples of praying for mercy. Praying for mercy. Even though God had already declared judgment, someone would pray. Yeah. I mean, I, I can think of a few examples. For example, Moses. Uh, Moses uh, asked to go into the promised land, and God said, no. no. But he still prayed, even though he knew God had said, no, you're not going. He still asked. But God still said, no. Um, that wasn't, doesn't mean Moses re- was rebellious. It just was something, an expression of his heart, I think. Or perhaps Paul. Where did Paul not get his prayers answered? Thorn in his flesh. But he still prayed at least three times that God take it away. And God said, no, three times in a row, right? He still prayed. What about uh, David, who prayed for his son to live when God had said, your son will die. (coughs) But he still prayed and fasted that his son would live, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Or Hezekiah. What was his prayer? Do you remember? What happened to him and what was his prayer? He was about to die. Yes. And he said, um, could, he get, could he be cured? But time went back. You know, okay, it's a fascinating story. And we'll have to look it up later in um, Isaiah 38. But Isaiah told him, you're going to die. The Lord has said, you're going to die. That's it, you, you've sinned and you're going to die. And Hezekiah prayed and said, God, uh, can I have a bit longer? And God said, all right, I'll give you another 15 years. That was worth praying for, yeah. I would say, and, uh, and so on. I think, I share this, at least partly because, is, don't you find prayer a bit of a mystery? I mean, a lot of the time, why do we pray for what we pray for? Are we praying for the right things? Do we have a real understanding of God and of his will? Are we really submissive to his will? Do we really know what his will is? I mean, there's so many mysteries in prayer, and yet, Jesus prayed. Everybody in the Bible that's faithful to God prayed. We're commanded to pray. We're given hope through prayer. We're given promises about prayer. Prayer is so much part of what's important in our Christian life. Without prayer, I don't think we're really ever going to get to see God work in our lives in the way that he could, or through us, and we're not going to develop the relationship with God that's available without prayer. But it's still a mystery. Some of you know um, I do some prayer coaching as a, as a thing I do. And I have uh, three clients at the moment that I'm coaching. And uh, one of them is in Scandinavia. And one of them is in Africa. And one of them is in the UK. And it's fascinating to correspond with these people about their questions about prayer. Their journey in prayer. Their, what they want to learn in prayer. And they're all so different. And they often ask me questions for which I have absolutely no answer. Or I don't know how to answer. I should cut this bit out of the video. I don't want them to see it. Um, Because, no, I'm kidding. But, of course, I'm going to be asked things I don't understand. And I have to accept that. I feel inadequate to meet their needs. But it's part of the journey. We're learning as we go through our Christian life about prayer and about our Father. So, with that in mind... We got some things to do here. I got uh, some handouts, so could we hand these out? And uh, Christine, could you help just pass a few to the back, if you don't mind? Whoops, that one there we go. Let's go to the back. And Bill, I'm going to take one. Okay. <coughs> now, here's what we're going to do with the time left. I'm going to ask us to think about what what do we learn about 
Jesus' relationship with the Father through this time of prayer in Gethsemane here. Right? Old, um, some of them are two-sided, and some of them my printer malfunction, and there's two sheets. So you'll have to check. You should have either a sheet with two sides, or two separate sheets with different stuff on them. Okay, so see what you got. Let's send those around. Right, so can I ask you, let's take um, five minutes for this. All right, we won't deal with, deal with all these questions, but at least deal with one or two. And turn to the person next to you and have a chat in five minutes about what does this prayer in Gethsemane show us about Jesus' relationship with his Father? What, is, what he says, what he doesn't say, that he might say, we might say, what happens after the prayer, what doesn't happen after the prayer. Jesus' relationship with the Father. Let's take five minutes and have a discussion with somebody next to you about this, and then let's see what we find. Five minutes, and I'm setting a timer. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have discovered so far. Uh, what do we learn about Jesus' relationship with his Father from this passage? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Any thoughts? What st stands out to you? That's very interesting. It's his father's will, but he still goes to the father, even though the will is so hard. Trust. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, good. Good stuff. All right. What else? Anything else? Stand out? What do we learn? Who recognizes the authority of the father? That's a great point. Yeah, supreme authority. Ultimate authority. Sovereignty. Yes, good. I, there's an intimacy there as well, because mm -hmm. you wouldn't go to your father to ask him to say what you know again as well. Mm -hmm. mm. It's confident in the relationship, even though it's so difficult in that particular moment. That's a great point. Confident. God is, appro is approachable. Some is approachable, but there is trust there, and there's some uh, for um, relationship there. Anyway, yes. It's yes. Yes, yeah, he, he believes God is approachable, and he yeah. approaches yeah. God, yeah? yeah, in a very personal, personal way. Good, thank you. Anything else? Um, he didn't get what he wanted, but God gave him what he needed, which was strength. Okay. He didn't get what he wanted, but he got what he needed. Right. I think the, the angel coming to strengthen him is a fascinating yeah. thing, isn't it? What does it remind you of? Remind you of anything? Similar incident? Elijah. Elijah, but also Jesus. I'm thinking about Jesus specifically. Angel comes to him in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of that testing, right at the beginning. And here we see an angel at the end, you could say. Interesting. God's strength is available. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yes? We've got all those things. We've got it's a bit like a parent and a child relationship. A lot of our children mm -hmm. normally are, but they don't even say no, but they're still going to come after you. They don't have this, but can I do this? In that mm -hmm. point, that obviously the freedom they have to come out after you is what you trust in intimacy, and again, the hope that you might change the world. Right. They still come to you. They still know you're their parent. They know you have the power. Yeah. And they, hopefully they trust you for something good to come out of it, even if it's a no. <laughs> right? Even if it's still a no. Yeah, it doesn't stop them coming back another time. Yeah. At least not till they're, they're quite a lot older anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true, isn't it? So I'm not going to give a lot of things out here that I think about, because I think... I think there's just so much to learn from Jesus and his relationship with his Father here. And the reason for giving a handout with some scriptures on is to help us to think about this, this coming week. And particularly, how does our view of the Father affect the way that we pray? How does our view of the Father affect the way we pray? What can't, what's different between Jesus' view of his Father and our view of God as our 
father? Where, where are the gaps there and where can we learn and grow? I think those are the key things to be thinking about here. Um, just a thought, and I won't t- uh, do this in detail, but I'd like to encourage you to look into the Gospels for what Jesus teaches the disciples about his father. One of his key things, he taught about the kingdom, he taught about many things, but he taught about the Father to his disciples. Some scriptures here, Luke 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Luke 11, when you pray, say Father, and it emphasizes that. Luke 12 also, scriptures I think are on the sheets there. So think about that, read those scriptures, and think about how much you're letting Jesus educate you about the Father. Let Jesus educate you about God as Father, and it will be a tremendous help. One last thing at the end here I just want to uh, flag up really. Um, He says in chapter 22 verse 42, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And he goes to the cross, and then on the cross we have the criminals crucified with him. And one of them says, um, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says this in verse 43 and then 46. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, just after that, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The point, point here being, Jesus had such confidence in his Father that this was going to turn out well. He could even tell the thief on the cross before his own death, you will join me in paradise. Because he knew that through the cross, he would be with the Father forever, and he would take the thief, or the thief could come be with him forever with the Father. There's tremendous confidence in Jesus, even while he's on the cross. And I think that confidence was strengthened by his prayer in the garden. He needed to pray that prayer, to have that confidence from God that this was going to turn out well. And frankly, there are many things that have happened in my life and may well happen again, or some similar things, that make me question whether things will turn out well. And maybe you've got things in your life that make you question whether it will turn out well. I think this is where we need to pray. We need to be with God in prayer and find that confidence in Him and strength in Him and strength from Him so that we can trust Him during the trial till we get to the place where all is well. All will not be always well in this life, but all will be well in the future. If we hold on to him and his promises. So what surprised you today about prayer? How to pray against God's will is not the normal sermon title. There is a way to pray about God's will. Let's do it well, let's do it wisely. If anything surprised you, how will your prayer life be different going forward from today? It's good to be a little surprised and shaken up and think about these things, what we learn here from Jesus. Let's be sure to be praying honestly with God, like Jesus, but trusting him because his will is always always better than ours. Amen.